10th of June, Tom Tor, Zuryanka, Chursky. We awoke to a cloudless sky and joined the queue for the loo, congratulating ourselves on our foresight in bringing our own supply of toilet tissue. A poor quality paperback was provided in the loo by the Russians. As caring as ever, tearing pages from the back of the book, the theory being that no one would have a strong enough constitution to remain in the loo long enough to read very much anyway. No food was available, so we made do with a long drink of orange flavoured water. At the airfield, a large bemused crowd had gathered to bid farewell to the strange foreigners. Poverty was very apparent all around, with young children without shoes and wearing thin clothes, shivering in the cool 20 degree morning temperature. The trip to Zoryanka, an easy two and a half hour transit over flat, marshy, wooded countryside, did not end as planned at the airport. The location of the town, in a flat plain surrounded by rivers, makes it prone to flooding in the spring thaw. Consequently, the airport is moved to another large field nine kilometres away and given the unimaginative name of Zoryanka Nine Kilometre Strip. Even this strip is not much above the water table and the surface for the most part was soggy and rutted, especially around the parking areas used by Aeroflot AN24s. The centre of the runway, however, was surprisingly very dry and any movement on the sandy shingle and stony surface stirred up huge clouds of thick dust. We happened to land at a busy time, and watched in amazement as passengers, with an incredible variety of baggage, arrived from the collection point in town in the back of large trucks. We were astounded as an AN24 of Aeroflot, which was loaded and ready for departure, became bogged down in the mud at the edge of the runway, and was simply hauled out by a huge truck with wire horses attached. It then just taxied to the runway and took off and went on its way. In the UK we would at least expect the mud to be washed off from the undercarriage and a serviceability check carried out before flight. The airline staff obviously didn't think such frivolities were necessary. Russian aircraft are certainly rugged and their method of operating differs widely from that of their western counterparts. Ground equipment and fuel was available. However, on the busy airfield there was only one qualified driver on duty. We were forced to wait until all civilian traffic was serviced before we got our fuel for our aircraft, by which time we were covered with a thick film of dust. Bill and Tony took the chipmunks to Chersky for the 2 hours 45 minute flight on a northeasterly track into the cold waste towards the Arctic Ocean, with increasing amounts of snow and ice and fewer and fewer trees. Chersky was located alongside a river filled with pack ice and surrounded by a wilderness of tundra and thousands upon thousands of frozen and semi-frozen lakes. Not an ideal place to visit for a summer holiday. The base is a busy operational military civil complex with an emphasis on the military side of operations. Our arrival caused great consternation amongst the Inspector Clouseau Peter Sellers look-alikes in long leather coats and trilby hats which seem to be the standard apparel for Russian security personnel. Tony Cowan had an interesting conversation with our customs official when Yuri, who was anti-state security, refused to cooperate. When asked to translate, Yuri said that his English was not too good and the customs official replied, we have a problem, to which Yuri replied, no. You have a problem. Eventually, Honor was satisfied and we all completed customs forms, despite already being in Russia for over two weeks, and were given police consent to remain overnight clearance. Security was probably so strict because of the sensitive nature of the base and proximity to the USA, the old Cold War enemy. All of the many spectators were amazed when Yuri set up the Sputnik telephone on a chipmunk wing and got through to Moscow in seconds to report our progress. We were increasingly surprised at the number of handheld video cameras in the Russian outback. As soon as the island door was opened, the lenses were poked in and footage of the spares and baggage taken, no doubt for assessment later. The town had a frontier look about it. 
High-rise apartment blocks on 10-foot concrete piles had solid ice mixed with rubbish beneath them and everywhere had the sweet smell of decay. The roads were full of giant potholes and mountains of rubbish and unwanted items lay just where they had been discarded. A three-bedroom flat was allocated to us for the night in one of the better apartment blocks and Yuri and Tony Severs, accompanied by a security policeman, set about procuring rations for our evening meal. A small shop was persuaded to open, and £130 was paid for enough food for our stay. In the UK, a comparative basket of groceries probably would have cost in the region of £25. Back in the flat, we were visited by a couple of policemen, off-duty now, and much more friendly who brought a plastic bag full of herring-type fish and two loaves of bread. They stayed to talk about our adventures. The cooker in the flat was ancient and took an age before our meagre meal was ready, after which we finally rolled into bed at 0130 hours at the end of a hectic day.